You're listening to Country Music Success Stories featuring Music City mentor J.C. Don Valeris. Now, here's your host, Candy O'Terry. I've got it bad for Nashville, and every time I'm there, I can't wait to go back again. J.C. Don and I were so excited when we landed this interview because it's with a singer, songwriter, musician who just happens to be the newest member of the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. So we were armed with my laptop and remote recording equipment, and we set out for the home of Kent Blazy. And as our car made its way up the hill to his home overlooking Nashville, I couldn't wait to hear about his climb, his success story. How did a guy originally from upstate New York make it in a town where everybody plays, everybody sings, and lots of people write? to become a platinum-selling songwriter whose music is heard every day all around the world. There were some pretty slim times when I thought, I'm going to have to get a job. Luckily, I would do singer-songwriter things. I would be in a jazz band and a bluegrass band and a country band and a rock band. So between all of them, I would be able to keep working. I had so many questions to ask. And as Kent welcomed us into his house on a hill, we settled in for a chat around his dining room table piled high with songwriting journals to talk about meeting Garth Brooks way before he was famous, the story behind their first big hit, If Tomorrow Never Comes, how co-writing is a little bit like dating, and what he is most proud of as an artist. I started out by asking Kent to take me back to when he first discovered his love of music. I can remember just being a little kid, uh, having... I guess they were Gene Autry records that were kind of yellow, and I would play them all the time on my little record player when I was like probably three or four or five years old and loved all those songs. So I think it started that young. Your first guitar at Mm -hmm. 16, lessons or were you self-taught? Tell me that story. Well, back then, if you bought a guitar, you got some group lessons that came with it. So I think there was maybe like eight or ten lessons with that but it's basically just learning chords and stuff after that i just started learning by myself you know and i had a guitar player that lived three streets over who was older than me and if i bought him cigarettes he would show me a guitar lick so, <laughs> that's so you contributed to his bad habit i did get some guitar lessons yes. ken Blazy. oh my god we just interviewed Lori mckenna and She talked about her bad kid poetry when she was growing up. I guess one of her brothers said, hey, you know, instead of writing poetry, why don't you use that guitar and start playing some songs? When I interviewed Mariah Carey years ago, she said she has journals filled with poems. This seems to be how songwriting begins. Mm -hmm. Is that how it started for you? That's how it started with me. I first wrote poetry and got it published like in uh, the high school yearbooks and stuff like that. And so it gave me a little bit of positive feedback that somebody must like what I do. So the minute I got a guitar, I just started trying to put the two together and started writing songs instead of poetry. What was the first song you ever wrote? You know, I believe it was actually a country song called Cry to Me. Was there a time when you said to yourself, I want to focus more on the songwriting in particular? What had happened was I had been on the road Uh, with my own band and then I ended up being um, a guitar player for an amazing singer-songwriter Ian Tyson who's like the Bob Dylan of Canada and he was very encouraging about my songwriting and said hey you need to move to Nashville so I'd been on the road and just was getting tired of the road and I thought well I'm going to come to Nashville and just focus on being a songwriter. You know you talked a little bit about someone who was a real early influence for you. Mm -hmm. How important has it been for you to have relationships within country music, to have a champion, someone who says, hey, this guy, Ken Blasey, he's really good. You know, that's the most important thing you can have because you really don't know the quality of what you're doing sometimes. You know, you're trying to do the best you can. But the big turning point to me was when I was with uh, Sonny LaMare one day. I'd been up in Canada and came home and went over to see him, and he had a new guy in the band named Mark Gray. And Mark Gray was probably one of the best piano players, singer, songwriters I'd ever heard, so soulful and stuff. So Sonny said, hey, 
play Mark some of your songs. And I played him some things, and he said, when you move to Nashville, look me up, and I'll help you any way I can. So I'm thinking, this guy thinks I'm really good. Ian Tyson thinks I'm really good. I might as well get down here and see what it's like, you know, take my chances. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to be objective about your own talent, sure. too. And then when someone else says, hey, you're really good at that, you start believing in yourself, right? Exactly. And that's such a inspirational thing to have somebody who actually believes in you and takes you under their wing. Tell us a little bit about what Nashville was like when you showed up. 24 years old, young and green. I think it was like one of the first months I got here, New York Times had an article that said country music is dead. So I thought, oh, <laughs> I said, picked the great perfect timing. time. <laughs> I just got in and started meeting people and seeing if they'd let me write songs with them. And also I can play guitar pretty good. So people would hire me to be on their sessions and things like that. You know, when you first get started, and of course, in the entertainment business, there's the old adage, don't quit your day job. Right. When you first get started, you probably had to have another job. What were the things that you did to earn a living? Well, the interesting thing is I pretty much from the time I started really playing guitar and played my way through college and everything else, that's pretty much what I did. That's amazing. And I mean, there were some pretty slim times when I thought I'm going to have to get a job, you know, but luckily I would do singer songwriter things. Seeing that I love all kind of music, I would be in a jazz band and a bluegrass band and a country band and a rock band. So between all of them, I would kind of be able to keep working. You know, I remember talking to Linda Ronstadt a million years ago, and she said, you know, I'm really proud of something that a lot of people don't know. I've never had to do anything but be a singer. Right. I didn't have to be a teller in a bank. I didn't have to work in McDonald's. I was never a waitress. I was always able to earn my living as a singer. And the same was true for you. Yeah. You have written seven number one songs with Garth Brooks. And you've also written with many other artists. But let's start with Garth. How did you meet him? I'm trying to have so many irons in the fire. I saw kind of where the music business was going. And it was slowing down again in the mid 80s. And so I started doing demos for other writers and started a little studio in my home. I started with a little four track, then an eight track. When I moved to Nashville, I'd always been a singer who'd made my living being the lead singer in a band. And so I'd take my songs around and they'd go, I like the song, but who the hell's singing that? So I realized in Nashville, the quality of the singers in this town is so spectacular that I needed the best people I could find to sing my songs. So when I started my demo studio, I started working with all this, like Billy Dean was one of the first ones that I knew because we kind of played together in a band and stuff like that. And so then I found uh, Faith Hill, who was a secretary. I found... Um, Capitol Records, right? Yeah. Trisha Yearwood, who was a secretary at MGM. Joe Diffie, who was working at Gibson Guitars. All these names. You know, all these names. And none of them could get a record deal. And so... How I met Garth is Bob Doyle, who became Garth's manager, knew I had a studio, and Garth was cleaning churches and selling boots at the time, and he knew he could make more money singing demos, so they came over to my house. They played me a cassette. You probably don't even remember what cassettes yes, are. Yes, I do. He played me six songs, and I said, well, I'll be glad to use you on some demos. So when they were leaving, Bob turned to me, and he said, you know, Garth writes a little bit, too, and I said, well, yeah, we can write together. So we set up a writing appointment, and it's a long story, but the first song we wrote was If Tomorrow Never Comes, when he was cleaning churches and selling boots, and people said he'd never get a record deal with a name like Garth. Let's talk a little bit about the friendship when you sit down with somebody who you don't really know very well, right? and you start writing a song. You know, it's like, I just walked into your house today. You don't know me from Adam, right? Mm -hmm. And we sit down and we start writing. Like, how does that happen? Well, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I attribute it to being like a first date. And you never know how it's going to go, um, whether you're going to have some chemistry or not. And hopefully you won't kiss at the end of the writing <laughs> appointment. But, um, you know, it's interesting. When Garth came in, what I try to do is have a whole kind of titles and ideas to run by other writers because that's always been my strong point is I keep books and books of titles from every year. I start out in little notebooks and when they get filled I put them in a bigger book and so when people come I'm ready. So I had all my ideas out. I had no idea who Garth Brooks was or what he 
was wanting to write or what he was trying to do. I mean, I'd only met him one other time. And he came in, and I was sitting at the couch, and at the time, he uh, was wearing these big, long dusters and tall cowboy boots and a cowboy hat. And he came in, and he stood up above me, and he said, I have this idea I've run by 25 writers, and nobody likes it. And I looked up at him, and I said, gee, thanks. <laughs> And he said, well, don't you want to hear it? He kind of got testy. And I said, yeah, all right, play, play me what you got. So he played me this idea. And, and I said, well, I like the idea because it's what my mother used to tell me about. Tell the people you love while they're still alive. And he said, well, what's wrong with it? And I said, well, you're killing somebody off in the first couple lines of the song. It's like killing the star of the movie off in the first three minutes. And he said, well, what would you do? And he says, I spit it out the whole first verse out. And that may be true because I was looking back on the original lyric and Garth wrote the first verse out in his handwriting and he's never written down another word we've ever written. So I know that's the truth. So I spit it out. At the end of the day, we had a song. We both loved this song. He did a little demo in my studio of just me playing guitar and him singing it, and that can't be bad. But we pitched it around town. We thought we had something great. And for a year, nobody was interested in it. And one night at the Bluebird Cafe, he got to sing one song, and he sang If Tomorrow Never Comes. And somebody from Capitol Records who would passed on him for the third time that week said, maybe we missed something, why don't you come back in? He came in, he got a record deal, and that was his second single. And it was interesting to me to see from all the people who passed on that song in town, people could have owned the publishing, they could have signed Garth and had a big hit, and... Uh, Nobody did. And so it gave me insight into who thinks what's a great song. And we've had letters from so many people from all over the world, how that song has touched them. It's been in weddings. It's been, you know, and everything you can think of. So that's one of my advice to young writers. If you really believe in something, keep going with it. Because what one person says 10 other people might disagree with, but you just need to find that one person that believes in what you have. So much of the time, it's also about serendipity, isn't it? Yes. Being in the right place Place at at the the right right time. time. That guy from Capitol Records who turned him down three times happens to be in the audience at the Bluebird. He picks that song. Tell me about when you first heard it on the radio. It was like a dream come true because I had always prayed being a songwriter that I would write a song that would change people's lives you know lift them up and and all that and so to me that song was it and still is it and so i just had to pull over the side of the road i can't say i cried but i may have you were probably close to it yeah i cried pretty easy so uh, (laughs) yeah tell us a little bit about i mean seven number one songs give me Mm -hmm. the list i ain't going down the sun comes up if tomorrow never comes midnight cinderella she's gonna make it um uh uh-oh Something else in there. (laughs) And then the other cool thing is a guy who was a big artist all over the world, but in America, Ronan Keating, recorded that song. And I happened to be over in Ireland on tour, and all these people were telling me, Ronan Keating's cut your song. And I'm like, I don't know who Ronan Keating is. He's a wonderful guy. I've interviewed him. Is he a gentleman? And what a voice on him, huh? What a voice. And so while we were over there, that song went number one in England. And so I thought, well, there might be something to it. So it was kind of cool. It was a worldwide hit for him except in America. So that was pretty exciting, too, to see your song that means so much to you get recorded by somebody else. And so I may be in Italy or, you know, somewhere else, and that song comes on. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. It's still got a life. It's still got legs. Have you ever been in the studio with Garth when he has recorded one of the songs that you've written together? You know, I don't think I have. Because I was um, wondering what that feels like when you see the artist interpret it and it starts to come to life. You know, I kind of feel like he likes to kind of do it on his own and he wants you to hear it afterwards, but he just kind of wants to be in the moment. And uh, I'm fine with that. It's fine for me to just hear him afterwards. Especially if it's a number one song. And then just go to your bank account and say... There this you feels go. Feels pretty good. Well, it used to be like that. I don't know <laughs> if it's like that as much anymore, thanks to Spotify and all that stuff. But. The list of artists and groups who have performed your songs could fall off the table that we're sitting at right now. I'm talking about Diamond Rio and Patty Loveless, whose voice I just love. Oh yeah, Patty, I miss voices like that. Oh man, and Gary Morris and Chris Young. 
right. who's on fire, you know? Finding the perfect song for an artist is kind of like capturing lightning in a bottle. It is. How does it feel when an artist comes to you and says they want to record one of your songs? It always is like, to me, a miracle or a dream come true because, you know, even Dean Dillon, who's probably one of the most prolific songwriters, had a great career of George Strait. He said, out of every 600 songs I write, I get six cut. And I would have to say for a long time, that's what it kind of was for me, too. You write 600 songs and you might get six cut. And back at that time, we had a whole lot of labels with a whole lot of artists. We probably had 20 labels with 20 artists. So you had 400 people to pitch to which ups your chances. And now I think there may be three labels, maybe 20 artists. So you have 60 people to pitch to, but most of them want to write their own songs or their labels told them they need to write their songs, whether they can write or not. And so it's a whole different world than it was back then. Well, speaking of back then, can you tell us a little bit about your hometown and in particular, Mm -hmm. what your family life was like? Well, it's interesting. I grew up in Woodstock, New York which then became famous for Woodstock Pop Festival. But even at the time, it's still a little town. We went back up there like two years ago, maybe 1,200 people. But there's a lot of artists that live up there. There's authors that live up there. People who are actors in New York City have homes up there. So you never knew who you were going to meet or who you're going to see. And so we would go to somebody's house and they'd say to me, well, I just wrote a book. You want me to autograph it to you? Or you go to a house and an artist would have a painting they're working on as big as this door. And you go, well, that's a pretty cool way to make a living. My mom was kind of a stay at home mom. And my dad worked for IBM. And back then IBM meant I've been moved. <laughs> so we moved from, okay. from idyllic Woodstock, New York to uh, Lexington, Kentucky. So my dad could uh, do the IBM thing. And He was always really encouraging to me because he said, you know, you don't want to work on the assembly line your whole life. So when I got into music and all that, he was probably one of the most encouraging people. And my mom was the same way, you know, and my sister was an incredible artist and photographer. And so they encouraged that creativity. But I think it was because of that whole relationship with Woodstock, New York, where there were so many diversities of talents from people. You know, as a little kid, I thought, wow, I think I'd rather make a living writing a book or doing a painting than having to go into work every day. And it also means that there was a value to creativity in your family because so often if you're an author or singer or songwriter or a visual artist, your family says, whoa, you know, you you can't really earn a living doing that. But your parents didn't say that. They didn't say that. I know that you lost your wife to cancer Mm -hmm. and you have a huge belief in supporting a local hospice. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about her and did she inspire any of your songs? Oh, she inspired If Tomorrow Never Comes, but she inspired a lot of songs and, uh, My favorite story is I was going through this period of time in the late 80s, and I had a cut on a really big group that was having number one records, and it was supposed to be a single. So I was kind of looking forward to it being a single to bring some money in because my stepson was going to start going to college, and, you know, on a songwriter's salary, you didn't have much to do. And so We need a number one song here, people. Exactly. That's (laughs) what it was. And so I was really looking forward to that. And the week before they were supposed to put it out, they changed their mind and put something else out. And so I was just crushed. So I just kind of quit songwriting. I painted the whole outside of the house for two weeks, and I went to work for a friend of mine repairing guitars and just was kind of like, what am I going to do? And I got a call from a friend in Lexington, Kentucky, who had a music store, and he had been like a second father to me. He had always helped me out and loaned me equipment, and I taught lessons there and worked in the store, and he said, I'm retiring. I would like you to have the business, and, um, you know, will you do it? And I'm like, well, yeah. And uh, so I was really excited, and I thought, oh, my wife's going to be so happy to move back to Kentucky. And so she comes home, and I'm like, hey, we can go up back to Kentucky. I can help own this music store. And she's like, I didn't come here for you to leave. I'm like. Words of wisdom from a wife, yeah. right? So uh, she said, we need to sell this house. We were out in Franklin, which is kind of, I don't know, it was a long way from Nashville. And I'd kind of gotten where I wouldn't come into music row anymore. So we need to sell this house and we need to get you closer to Nashville. So we sold the house, moved to Nashville closer to Music Row, and two weeks later, I met Garth. There's so much wisdom in that, isn't there? Yeah. 
I'm looking at this beautiful new record. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called Authentic. And boy, authentic seems to be the word for 2021. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about this record and what it means to you. A lot of it was created during the pandemic. I was down in um, West Palm Beach on March 13th to do a benefit that I've done for 15 years with Leslie Satcher. And the day we were supposed to do the gig, they canceled it. So by the time I got home, I'd lost every gig that I had for the whole year. So the first song that came out of me was Crazy Times that's on there because that's all everybody was talking about. Well, these, these are, are crazy, crazy times. times. After that song came out, I just started having these other songs come out. And um, I thought, I can't play in a band, which I love to do. Can I go in and record a session of songs? And so a lot of the studios were shut down, but Soundstage and Sound Emporium, where I ended up doing the record, they were still open, but it was like I said, it was everybody had to wear masks, hand sanitizer, six feet apart. But we went in and cut this record, and nobody had played. Two of the guys were in John Party's band, and they were shut down. They couldn't tour. And so everybody was really excited about getting in the studio and recording. And when we started playing, I started crying. It's like, wow, I miss this, you know, and you don't realize how much you miss live recording. And so we were so excited, we recorded 11 songs in one day, which I thought was pretty amazing. I'm looking at the record right now, and I wonder if you can tell me the story behind the song Faith Stronger Than Fear. Well, that was an older song, and I was writing with Garth the day that they blew up uh, Oklahoma City. So he says, I got to leave. I'm going to Oklahoma. You know, his mom had called him and said they blew out the windows in our house and the whole bit. So I was getting with this guy, Craig Wiseman. Now he's like the most famous songwriter in Nashville, Tennessee. But back then he was a drummer and trying to be a songwriter. And so I had this idea and we wrote it. And I thought, well, Garth is going to love this for, uh, you know, to sing for Oklahoma. Unfortunately, another great songwriter, Tony Arada, had written a song called The Change, which is blew mine out of the water. But um, when I started looking back on what I had, I thought, this song needs to be out right now. And so I went back in and uh, had to go look for the song, actually, and found it. And uh, I just thought, people need to have faith stronger than fear. You flip on the radio and you say to yourself, I wish I wrote that song. Oh, yeah. Oh, which yeah. one is it? Where do you want me to start? <laughs> um, uh, you know, some of my favorite are like Heart of the Matter by Don Henley. What a great song. Song Remembers When, Walk Away Joe. So many of the 90s songs were like that. I call them Pull Over to the Side of the Road songs. And the and, hair on your hair arms on your goes arms up. Stands up. And I don't hear those these days, you know. Uh, the only song that really made me do that this last year was uh, More Hearts Than Mine. What a well-done song and well-done way they produced the whole thing. They let the singer breathe and you could hear every word. And, you know, I miss that these days. This is a huge body of work. What are you most proud of, Kent? You know, I think I'm the most proud that I've actually made a living being a songwriter in Nashville, Tennessee, and also getting in the hall of fame i mean that's something every songwriter yeah dreams about doing and and i can't say i really thought that would be an option for a long time because you look at those names of the people that are on there and you go oh my god i would love to be in that category you know what has been the key to your success we always try to mentor young people and i'm just about to hand things over to J.C. Don Valeris, our Music City mentor. But if you could fill in the blank, the key to my success in country music was blank. Being prepared. Anytime I go into a writing session, like I said before, I have ideas. I tried to be the best musician I can. I love playing electric guitar. Uh, I play a lot of other different instruments. And so if we're right and then we get stuck, I'll say, well, let me break out the electric guitar. Let me break out a mandolin or let me break out something else that hopefully will spur creativity. And so that's, to me, the best thing. I come across so many young writers that come in and they don't have an idea. Sometimes they don't bring a guitar. They don't bring a computer. And it's like, what makes you a songwriter? You know, and uh, so that's that's the thing I can tell every young songwriter. You try to work your way up. You want to write with the best people you can, and hopefully you'll 
rise up like cream to the top. But if you're not prepared, people aren't going to write with you again. It's like, why do I want to waste my time sitting here where you want me to write the whole song and you get your name on it and own half the song? Kent Blasio, I want to say thank you for welcoming us to your home. Oh, thank you. And thank you for sharing your stories with us. I'm going to pass you over to J.C. Dawn. All right. Okay, I have to touch on this little thing that you spoke about earlier, which was you said 600 songs, Mm -hmm. and you may get four or five cut. Correct. Okay, so that takes an immense amount of dedication. Right. What kind of dedication do you have? Do you write every day? Do you write multiple times a day? Well, you know, when I first came to town... Up till even a few years ago, I, I write every day. There would be years where I was writing four times a day. And, you know, you rack up a lot of songs if you're writing four songs a day times 300 days a year or whatever. And um, I was just trying to learn. I was trying to meet everybody I can. And, you know, my biggest inspiration for that was Kim Williams, who, you know, he moved to town, and I had never seen anybody come with such a vengeance to be a hit songwriter. And he wrote four times a day, every day. He didn't take a weekend off or anything. And so in four or five years, he was songwriter of the year at ASCAP, two different years. And the more you write, the better you're going to get at it. And the more you can write with other people and see how they approach songs, how they approach uh, the music of songwriting or the lyrics, you can take that when you're writing by yourself or you can take that when you're writing with other people. Incredible advice. So if a brand new songwriter shows up in town tomorrow morning Mm -hmm. and they come to you and they say, tell me one thing I need to know, what do you tell them? If you're a new songwriter in town, the way you're going to get known, the way you're going to work your way up the ladder is to be prepared and have people after you leave the writing appointment go, wow, they'd be somebody worth writing with again. And that's, that's the best thing you can do. That was the remarkable story of one of the most creative writers on this planet, Kent Blasey. Hi, I'm JC Don Valeris, your Music City mentor. I have always deeply admired songwriters. There is just something so special about the journey of a song. Coming up with an idea, writing it down, and then turning your words and melodies into different shapes and sizes until everything fits just right. And then there's the collaboration part. That magic that happens between a couple of writers who pour their talent and emotion into crafting this three-minute little masterpiece. All with the potential of it being heard by millions and millions of people. I have to say my favorite part about songwriting really is that collaboration part. It's just so special when two people get into a room and their vibrations just click. I remember when I first started co-writing, a friend said this to me. When you write a song with another person, always remember you are essentially going into business with that person. So always choose your co-writers wisely. When I first heard that line, I kind of brushed it off. But the more I wrote and the more tiny bits of success came to me, the more I understood it. If your song gets cut by another artist, that means you're going to get paid. And that also means the exchange of a license or publishing and royalties and who knows what else. Now imagine that song hitting the top of the charts, getting placed in movies or in a television commercial. It really does have the potential to take on a business-like aspect. God forbid somebody comes out of the woodwork with a copyright complaint. I know that sounds scary, but it can happen. I wanted to talk with you today about the importance of co-writing, how you can be prepared the next time you're in a room with another person, getting ready to write what could be the greatest hit of all time. The first thing I really want you to think about here is whether or not you're ready to co-write. By this, I mean, Have you written enough songs on your own in enough different styles that you really can meet your co-writer halfway? Make sure you have enough songs in your catalog to showcase your work. Many writers are going to want to hear your style before agreeing to write with you. Demo some of your very best work to show them. Number two, like Kent told us in the interview you just heard, so many new writers go into writing sessions completely unprepared. When you go into a co-write without a hook or melody or even a subject matter, it shows a lack of respect for the person you are writing with. Always have a few titles or ideas in your back pocket to pull from. Don't always rely on the person you're writing with to bring the idea to the table. Number three, make sure you are truly collaborating. They call it a co-write for a reason. 
The minute you enter a songwriting session in Nashville, you're going to automatically be part owner of the song that's created in that room. Make sure you're contributing to it. You want to be considered valuable to your co-writer, because if you are, chances are you'll be asked to write again. I know some days the inspiration is flowing more than others, but always try to throw out as many ideas as you can. Even if it's not the perfect fit, it might spark something that is. Number four, stay engaged. I know it can be easy to let your mind wander when a song is taking longer than you'd like to get worked out. But I'll tell you, one of my biggest pet peeves in a writing session is when a co-writer starts picking up their phone, posting to social media, and getting totally distracted. Of course, we all need a break sometimes, but there's an appropriate way to do that. If the vibe is getting stale, take a walk, go to the restroom, get a drink, but don't sit in the room across from your co-writer snapchatting with your friends and taking pictures of yourself. It's just not the right thing to do. Finally, number five. If you and your co-writer have created something you both feel is truly special, try to come to an agreement on demoing the song. There's nothing worse than spending hours creating something and then having it never see the light of day. Meet your co-writer in the middle and go halves on a demo. If your budget is small, maybe one of you can offer to sing instead of paying a studio vocalist. And if you can't afford a band, demo it acoustically. Anything is better than that song sitting in your voice memos and never having the chance to land with an artist. With all of that being said, here's my last little tip. Don't forget to register your songs with your PRO. Whether you're with ASCAP, CSAC, BMI, or SOCAN, you can jump online and register the song you just wrote for free. And it will protect you. If you aren't currently with a PRO, visit the websites of any of the above for more information on how to do that. If you're writing songs, you really should register as a writer, and in certain instances as a publisher too. I promise it'll be one of the best things you've ever done for your songwriting career. Happy co-writing! For a free tip sheet on co-writes, just go to candioterry.com backslash country music podcast. Subscribe to JC's YouTube channel for insights and advice on how to make it in Nashville. And if you liked our podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Follow us on social at Candy O'Terry and at JC Don Valeris. And thank you so much for listening to Country Music Success Stories.